Namaste. Namaste. I'm really happy to be here, R.D. Yeah? Yeah, this is great for me. We are, we are very, very old friends, and we've got a number of things in our background that we, we share. We share Maharaji, India, and we share Harvard. Yeah. That's true. And yeah. we share psychology. Yes. Yeah. Um, I first met Ram Dass when I was a, a first year graduate student at Harvard. And by cosmic coincidence, I was led up to your father's farm in Connecticut in midwinter, where you were sitting, having just come back from India the first time. And uh, when I walked in and saw this guy in white, with a long white beard, with all of these Hindu <laughs> uh, deities on the wall, it kind of blew my mind. But then when you started talking, that really blew my mind. <laughs> and it turned out that uh, I was in the program at Harvard that you had been hired and fired from by my main professor, David McClellan, five years before. So, of course, the first thing I did was invite you back to speak at Harvard, <laughs> it did. which was a wonderful event. Started at seven, ended at two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I get, uh, I, I get, get on and on and on. <laughs> and, and it was wonderful, and uh, it was so wonderful. I ended up going to India a year later with uh, a guy named Krishnadas and another guy named Rameshwadas. Now. And uh, and then spending about a year, well, actually about 15 months with Maharaji on and off. And uh, and it is, our lives are so interwoven. Uh, you were the best man at the wedding of Tara and, and me years later. And uh, we've traveled together many times. We built a room for you in our house. You just never lived in it. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, yeah. Yeah. The bus. We all know the bus. Oh, okay. So in India, the uh, the time Maharaji met the bus with all of the sats, many of the sat song on it, we're coming from Bodh Gaya. We're trying to get to Delhi, and we went through Allahabad. You had just come back, and you hadn't found Maharaji yet, and That's you right. we wanted to get on to Delhi. But I I had been at the Kumbh Mela. And uh, I said, um, we really should see the, the Mela. It's like a sea of yogis, it's really wonderful. So I guided the bus over to the Mela grounds where these two rivers meet in Allahabad. And uh, instead of finding th three million yogis and, and uh, pilgrims, we found empty sand. <laughs> and I, I was a little, didn't know what to do. So I remembered there was a little Hanuman temple over to the side. And I directed the bus over to that temple and Ramesh says, hey, there's Maharaji. And he was standing by the side waiting for us. That was the first you saw him, I think, your second time back. In the yeah. 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 We all got off and touched his feet. Uh, and yeah. Remembrances, remembrances, remembrances. And here we are. Here we are. We were talking about, uh, before this webcast, about planes of consciousness yeah. and different models. And I, I remember when I was in India with Maharaji, there was one monsoon season where we had a big plan to do a retreat at a little village named Kosani. And uh, it, was, it was down the road from Kenshi, Maharaji's ashram. And we were expecting this teacher, Manindra, to come. He was uh, from Bogaya. He was Joseph Goldstein's main yeah. teacher. And Manindra said he would come. And so we gathered about 20 or 30 of us. And Manindra never showed up. So we were there for monsoon season. And um, I ended up reading a very fat book 
that Meninder had recommended, which was a, a map of the mind from a Buddhist psychology point of view. And as a psychologist, I was really fascinated. But it was also a map of the states of consciousness that you got in. And in that map, well, I think the first thing that was important for me to know, and you were the first time I really sensed this, was that there was something else other than just ego-based consciousness, which is all psychology was about. Yeah. And then going to meet Maharaji made it very clear that it was really something else yeah. that somebody could embody it. That was, uh, in my first visit to India, I came back with like a jewel from, uh, um, of memories of Maharaji. It was so, so different than psychology. And I came back just wanting the, uh, wanting the West to understand these, um, this kind of consciousness. And Yeah. Did you, did you, uh, all uh, my, uh, um, Indian garb and... <laughs> well, you know, uh, when I invited you back for that talk at Harvard, and uh, you gave the talk in a long white gown, Kulfi, I guess. Yeah. And you had this jola, and you had a big white beard, and you sat cross-legged on the desk instead of going to the podium. <laughs> like, and it was clear that not only was there something else, you were also something else. <laughs> and you were channeling Maharaji so strongly. Uh, you just been back a few months. Yeah. And the Shakti in the room was unbelievable. And uh, this is a room, uh, you know, at Harvard that had never had an ounce of Shakti in it before. <laughs> so uh, it, it lasted and lasted. And uh, I think it was a taste for, I think what you were doing and have done all these years is channeled, been a conduit for Maharaji. Yeah. And given people a felt sense that, of this other way of being. But you remember when you're talking, when we talked to, you said that somebody, a fellow psychologist, asked you about me. Yeah, so the next day I'm having lunch with one of my clinical psychology professors who hadn't gone to the talk, and he wants to hear about the talk, and I'm saying, well, this guy sat on the th table cross-legged for five hours, and he was wearing a gown, and a, he was carrying some kind of bag, and, and what you were saying, and then he says to me, in, like in a kind of confidential clinical tone, he says, tell me, is he psychotic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, well, if this is psychosis, I'd like some too. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, maybe the, you and I touched Maharaji makes it makes it uh, understandable about the high 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 um, planes of consciousness right. Right. because you know he, he's sweet and all this thing and he's exuding with love and he's got a something sense of humor but most uh, something something that you sensed uh, uh, that he uh, the other consciousness yes yeah. the other consciousness Those those kind of consciousnesses are they're not available to us in our normal waking minds, and 
and we can, I guess, at them, talk about them uh, as as fantasies. I mean that when I came back from India, I found myself, and you must have it all the time, a scientist and being with Maharaji just, just, she don't fit that well. <laughs> and I could, ha I, uh, because in behaviorism doesn't touch Maharaji. But you can't, you, 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 you with him and you want to ca ca capture, that's funny, uh, get something and bring back, but there's nothing there, there's nothing, there's nothing at all. I mean, most of us, Maharaji uh, devotees, bring back something in our hearts or something in the way we be, mm -hmm. like Krishna does. And You, I think. Yeah. I try. You try. <laughs> <laughs> Those books. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really tough having the role of being a psychologist and a science writer and having been with Maharajan for many years. When I was at the New York Times, for example, I went completely underground because it didn't seem to fit. But uh, now, science is changing uh -huh. in a very significant way. Yeah, because um, one of my close friends at Harvard was a guy named Richard Davidson. Richie uh, stayed in psychology. I left and went into journalism. Mm -hmm. But Richie, after many years underground, also kind of came out of the closet as a practitioner, and he was really uh, first turned on to the something else by you. He used to give a class in Cambridge yeah. in those days. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he had been a meditator all these years, and then he started, then the Dalai Lama said to him in a meeting that I actually put together and invited him to in India, Dalai Lama said, the meeting was on destructive emotions, he said, Buddhism has a lot of methods for managing destructive emotions that are very effective. Take them outside the religious context, study them rigorously, and if you validate them, if you find they're useful to people, spread them as widely as you can. Which is a very compassion, that's like a bodhisattva yeah, act. Yeah, sure. You know, you don't have to be Buddhist to benefit from these things. So now, with the Dalai Lama's help, Richie has been doing brain studies of really advanced yogis. And he finds that not only are, you know, are they in better health physically, but their brains are better in many ways and they're different functionally. And, you know, you can only speculate where Maharaji was. You, yeah. You're saying you had a fantasy of electrodes on Maharaji's, it was not gonna happen, not on his head. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's so clear, from a Tibetan point of view, uh, some, you know, he was a Mahasiddha. From our point yeah. of view, I mean, his plane of consciousness would be, or, from the Indian point of view, it was Sahaj Samadhi, I guess, mm -hmm. which means that he not only experienced Samadhi states or fire states of meditation, but he had changed his being to, to have them as, in an ongoing way, stabilized in those. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's, uh, Sahaj Samadhi is many planes of, at once. Yes. The Sahaj Samadhi, the yeah. highest Samadhi. Yeah. 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 
he, 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 he was among us, and he was one with God. Yeah, that was good. And you felt it so powerfully when you're with him. So, Richie, uh, what school is he? At? Uh, He's at Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Now. Yeah. And they bring bring uh, meditators, old old meditators. Well, because a Dalai Lama was involved, yeah. these yogis who would never consider doing something like this will go to Wisconsin, and these are people that have done. 50 or 60,000 hours of practice cumulatively, which means several three-year retreats often. And uh, they, they do all kinds of brain studies of them. But there's, there's such good meditators that I saw uh, an experiment where one, one of these guys was in there and they said, what we'd like you to do is go into four different meditative states, full concentration, you know, samadhi, uh, compassion, a visualization, and an open presence, which is kind of like a non-dual state. Yeah. But we, because of the experimental paradigm, we need you to do each one of them for exactly 60 seconds. When you hear that, eh, go into the state, and then when you hear another buzzer, go into a neutral for 30 seconds, and we need you to do this six times in succession. And he did. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 yeah, he did. And what he, what Richie has found is distinct brain profiles for each of those. Yeah. Yeah. So this, all of a sudden, for society, and this, I think, is the key thing. I mean, what you have been doing is embodying and channeling this other way of being in the world. And what Richie is doing is saying for people that don't have that kind of experience, either of a Maharaji or of you, saying, look, Science is finding that this exists. Yeah. This, what they say is not some fantasy, some cute cultural myth. It's actually a manual for the mind that works. Yeah. And, you know, for, I think for many people that's an important way to hear that message. It, it gives it a certain stamp of, it's okay. Yeah. I, I sometimes, I... Uh, play with these uh, other consciousnesses. Uh, uh, my, uh, I feel like I'm creating them in my on mind, uh, my imagination. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And they're not hard, you know. Mm -hmm. And I then I get them and I play with them in my um, soul and through different planes of consciousness. And I keep wondering why am I just why? why? Because I'm a behaviorist. <laughs> And, uh, yeah. You mean the you that was a psychologist can't understand how this stuff works and, and why yeah. you do it? Yeah. I remember in psychedelics, uh, we, we were our, we were our own subjects. <laughs> and we were, because we were going within. Sure. And some of our colleagues would see here. Here we were doing these studies, but we were going to experiment on ourselves. And I, they just couldn't understand it. They just couldn't understand it. Well, that was pushing the paradigm quite a bit. Just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little too far, it turned out. <laughs> well, we, we are free. Uh, well, maybe you are, but I... 
<laughs> free of psychology. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not totally free. <laughs> but you're very free. Very free. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I, th I have to thank you because I think you made me unfit for a career in psychology. And I don't, <laughs> I've never thanked you for that. But that was a big favor for me, anyway. Uh, being yeah. able to explore. Because to explore consciousness back in those days was a subversive act. It, it was a, that yeah. is still a, a subversive Maybe it still is a subversive act, but uh, it's, uh, it's a good thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, to, to be subversive in that way. But um, subversive is in, in fantasy world. That's right, that's right. That's right. Because these practices and these states and all of that changes your relationship to the kind of rigid structure of ego and all the thoughts. And you realize that you're not your thoughts. You don't have to believe your thoughts. You are some, you're, you're a consciousness, not the content. Yeah, not the content. Yeah. Right, right. I've been, uh, I was just. Uh, writing to my, uh, to a friend who is uh, having her 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 uh, 80th birthday, and I said, uh, please keep in mind, you are a soul which is infinite, mm. All right. mm. and. You're only selling the braiding, the birthday of your, of your, of your, of your body. Ah. That's a pretty good thing. Well, that's a change in perspective. I know it. <laughs> I know it. Hmm. Okay, Mike. Hi there. So we'll, uh, we, we took quite a few questions, and uh, let's start with one of them. Uh, after 40 plus years of feeling that my spiritual practices can take me all the way, I've been reflecting on the possibility that some psychological work with a therapist might be crucial. Do you feel that psychological work is absolutely necessary, and what would the benefits be? Well, I can, I can speak to that. Uh, it's funny you ask because the reason I'm out here uh, is that I'm on a book tour uh, with my wife. She wrote a book which we just happen to have right here. It's called Mind Whispering, uh, a new map to freedom from self-defeating emotional habits. And it speaks exactly to this question. It maps different levels or modes of being from places of being totally stuck, what you could call them even clinical problems, to ordinary um, patterns and habits that we get in childhood and bring into our relationships as adults that are also a way of being stuck, to being pretty uh, secure in a positive state, but still an ego, and then going beyond into a level where you're awakened it's an entire spectrum of consciousness. And she talks about, for example, how uh, people who have been long-term practitioners but have never done any psychological work sometimes find, as you're saying at a certain point, yeah. you know, I've got to clean up my act. And she su suggests how to do that in a way that can shift you from these stuck modes into uh, a free space, a free internal space. So there are, there are methods, there are they're well known, uh, and she's put them all together in this book, Mind Whispering. And you know, I've tried some, and I find it pretty useful myself. Um, I had people, therapists, when when I've said, um, be careful who your therapist is. Mm. Because mm. unless your therapist is Buddha, yeah, then you can he, he, he can, came up, and uh, 
you've got to because the, the, the therapist will bring you down exactly down to physical sure sure because they're reinforcing the ego yeah. level but the nice thing about the mind whispering approach you don't necessarily need a therapist you just need to know what to do I see. Sometimes, if you're like really stuck, it's helpful to work with a therapist. But you can do it in a limited way. The the model of uh, kind of the psychoanalytic therapist who is continually reinforcing yep. a goal. I think that's an old model now. There are more therapists I who, hope so. who practice uh, themselves. <laughs> yes. In fact, and I think that's what you want to find is someone who understands the practice side as well as the psychological side. My my therapist, my analytic therapist, uh, my Freudian analytic therapist in California, when I was going to Harvard, and he said, "You, I'm recommending you get a therapist in Cambridge because you can't you can't you can't function." I don't think you can function, and I don't think, I, I don't think, uh, that's what you want, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's almost like a curse, actually. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I have it. <laughs> you seem to have done okay. <laughs> I wonder how he's doing. <laughs> Do you have another question? Excellent, thank you. Uh, would you speak about the singing, the Hanuman Chalisa, as a spiritual practice? Well, it's part of bhakti yoga, of the heart yoga. And um, because it's a heart yoga, yoga in, it's, it opens the heart through singing, and and it it reinforces uh, uh, calling upon the names of God uh, because that's that's the names of the unknown. This thing we're talking about and I remember. Ram, 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 Maharaji was Ram, 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 Ram. I think that that combination of music and the names of God it is a winner. <laughs> it's a winner. And I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't the question about the Hanuman Chalisa yeah, or, Hanuman Chalisa. Oh, ha Hanuman Chalisa. The Hanuman Chalisa is, for those of you that don't know, is 40, 40 verses uh, in praise of Hanuman, the monkey. And I heard it first in, in India and I told them it wouldn't it wouldn't do in the West because it's too long, and um, and I I couldn't learn it. <laughs> I couldn't either. <laughs> so now that I'm old, I can't remember it, and. So I have to look, smile, and read it. Uh, Hanuman 
Hanuman's life is only he loves God, loves loves Han uh, loves uh, Ram, and um, he's so much in love with Ram. Uh, his whole body, it, Ram, 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 and he is he is an incarnation of Shiva. Shiva looked down at Ram's. Fighting with Ravana, his the bad guy, and he said, "I've got to go. I've got to go back down, down, down. I've got to help him, and I think I'll go through. Go as a monkey and." His seed was carried by the wind into Anjani, mm. the, the uh, monkey goddess. Hanuman is always mischievous. Like when he was still a baby, he saw the moon, or the sun, which is moon, sun, the sun. And he, he thought it was a fruit, and he, he reached the sun, and the gods were upset about and. He was um, uh, he was helping Ram look for his wife uh, because the the bad guy stole his wife. Ravana, from Ram. Right. Yeah. Mm. And the feats that. Uh, Hanuman said, say, he said, like crossing the ocean, uh, flying, he thinks all those because he has in mind Ram. Mm -hmm. And he has in, in his heart Ram. Ram and Sita. And He, he is a combination of bhakti yoga, heart yoga, and karma yoga. Because he works whatever is in front of him and makes it into uh, a love message for, for, mm. for Ram, and this the, the, the Chalisa is full of these wonderful exploits, and I think the Chalisa is is honoring Ram, who is. Maharaji said, Hanuman and Christ are the same thing. And they're both serving, they're both with their hearts.
I think that the singing of the Chalisa or the saying of the Chalisa um, in, in a group is the most powerful uh, thing you can do to, to get you to God because the group the, the group their hearts are open they're like, it's like satsang and yeah So that sentence then. <laughs> Mike? Wonderful, thank you. Uh, looks like we have time for uh, one more. Um, how do emotions play, so that's a tough one to follow up with, by the way, uh, but we'll go with this one. How do emotions play into our spiritual path? In my work, I see people wanting to do a spiritual bypass and jump over the emotions into the spiritual. Do we have to go through them along our spiritual journey? Uh, and are they, are they part of the spiritual journey? Yeah, I, I think, um, well, Tar's book, Mind Whispering, speaks directly to that, but uh, it's a, a rich question because if you ignore your emotional stuff, your emotional patterns, it can actually get in the way of the spiritual journey. Yeah. Uh, and you can pretend it's not there, you can do what's called the spiritual bypass, where you get deeply into spiritual practice and kind of suppress the emotion. But really, the question is, who are we day to day? Who are we with the people that matter most to us? Who, and, and that's where our emotions are gonna come up. And it's in how we deal with the emotions that you that part of spiritual practice occurs and also how you can see how you're doing in spiritual practice do we get sucked in by our emotions are we able to transform our emotions are mm -hmm. we able to recover and get into a better state uh, those are all i think key questions for sadhana for practice and put it trying to pretend that emotions don't exist or that you know well i don't have those feelings is really um, not helpful in the spiritual path, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but I, uh, I, those feelings uh, come up in the in the progression of thoughts. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That you can feel, you can you can feel something and uh, think about it and. Uh, think about it and then comes the feeling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we we like to work with witnessing the the mind right. and in the mind the emotions come That's right. and with the the emotion is We, whether the motion is helpful to our sadhana or not, and then we get hold of the helpful ones. Exactly. And it's an important distinction that you're pointing to, which is that some emotions, I mean love, devotion, compassion, are to be cultivated. And other emotions particularly are really uh, heavily glued, self-defeating emotional patterns are the ones that we have to do something yeah. about. That's what uh, Tara's book, Mind Whispering, is about, exactly yeah. those patterns, how to handle them in a spiritual context. Uh, and I think first we've got to make the distinction, as you say, is this a helpful feeling or not a helpful feeling? And if it's not a helpful feeling, what can I do about it? And if it's very lightly held, uh, you don't have to do much about it. Maybe just witnessing is enough. But if it's a really stuck one, like, you know, I learned to do this when I was a kid because uh, it helped me feel better from, because of the way my parents treated, those kind 
then it's good to it's a it's, habit. It's, yeah. yeah, an emotional habit. Then you need to change the habit. Yeah. And uh, to pretend otherwise, I think, is to get in the way of a full release, yeah. full opening. Yep. yep. Great, let's do... Uh, okay. <laughs> this is Tara's book again. This is Tara's book. <laughs> Mind whispering. Tara... Tara took me into the world of aging. That's true. Yeah. 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 When you were just a young thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you two did a, a series of workshops on aging. Workshops, yeah. that's right. Yeah. 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 Okay, Mike. Okay, uh, one more. Uh, this will tie right into the last one. Uh, I have anxiety with the experience of fear. Hmm. I feel invulnerable even after years of following your teachings, Ramdas. Please share your thoughts in this regard concerning fear. Well, I would start by making the same distinction. Some fear is appropriate and is fine uh, if there's a real threat. But there, most of our fears are because what Ramdas was saying. Uh, we have fear-provoking thoughts. And if there are patterns where, you know, you just can't stop ruminating about some imaginary imagined a catastrophe or something dire that's going to happen, those are exactly the kinds of thought patterns that we need to work with. Uh, apart from whatever, I think apart from whatever practices we do, if the practices themselves aren't enough to help. I, 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 this, this, this distinction from the ego, mm -hmm. from who we think we are, to the soul, who we really are. And the ego has fear underneath, exactly. underneath it. Yes. And the fear comes from their separateness. And their arms so big, so little, and the world is so big. And the, the, the soul is rooted in love mm. and rooted in fear and love. And that shouldn't be most people. This is from here to here. That's a sadhana. They sadhana to get that transformation. Yeah, and get from get get rid of the fear. Except when you say fear. Useful fear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think sometimes um, it's really helpful to realize, and this is one thing sadhana can help with, is that you don't have to believe your thoughts. And one of the things that helps tremendously with fearful thoughts is challenging those thoughts, not believing them. And it's something that um, I was telling you about this dialogue I saw between Aaron Beck, who invented cognitive therapy, which is about seeing your thoughts and challenging them. And the Dalai Lama who said, that's just what I do in my analytic meditation every morning. <laughs> See your thoughts as thoughts, and that's all they are. Well, the, the, the soul, um, witnesses the incarnation and the thoughts. Mm -hmm. I guess we all are witnessing our thoughts. 
Well, you know, there's two ways to be in relation to thoughts. One is to be caught in them. That's not a witness. That, that, that's yeah. being swept away. Yeah. And then changing your relationship, which is, I think, what spiritual work does. Yeah. Like, when you, when you get caught in your thoughts, you're identifying with thoughts. Exactly. Exactly. And what you down here, when you identify with the witness yeah. of the thoughts, oh boy, the witness just goes along, and the thoughts are exactly. Uh, wow. We just we be involved in just come just be involved with the witness and feel and just sense the thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Passing show. Yeah, passing show. Which, by the way, was a brand of cigarettes when we were in Delhi. That's right. In India. That's right. I still have the cover of the package, passing show. It's a good, th good motto to remember. Passing show. Okay. Any more? Ram Nuss, would you be willing to lead us through a meditation to close today's webcast? All right. Sit or lie so that your spine is straight. Start your breath. You can breathe in and out. We're noticing it, the breath at the tip of the nose or for, or for the uh, the lungs. Keep onto your breath. That is the primary object. Now your primary object shifts in, into the heart, the spiritual heart. And, and in the background is your breath. Your spiritual heart is 
radiates love. On the in-breath, I mean the out-breath, and on the in-breath, you take unconditional love from the God, from from Guru. Now, place the God and Guru in your heart. And they are, they are unconditionally loving. They are not judging your behavior or your thoughts. They want, they, they, they flood you with unconditional love. Just be flooded by them. In your heart. Flooded by unconditional love. Now that unconditional love in your heart expands into the universe. You you unconditionally love the universe.
you are the soul. Soul, loving awareness. Your heart doesn't judge one person or thing to another. They will all receive unconditional love. Radiate unconditional love from the God within. Now, we have radiated love around the world. It's a social action. We are all part of it. It always goes from heart to heart to heart. We are all surrounded by loving surrounded by the ocean of love. We are the ocean of love. We are love. We are love. Just be love. Be love. Be.
Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.